It is uh, HIE Awareness Month, and we are really excited today to bring you uh, one of our Medical Advisory Board Educational Series events. And I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Mohammed El Deeb today, who serves on our Medical Advisory Board, is the president of the Newborn Brain Society, um, is an incredible um, advocate and leader in um, in HIE and neonatal neurocritical care, and uh, really excited to welcome you today to this event, talking about HIE and cooling and all of those wonderful things as we dive into um, HIE Awareness Month this week. So welcome. Thank you, Betsy. It is my honor and pleasure to be with you today. And uh, really, uh, hope for HIE has been uh, eye-opening for me for the last uh, more than a year now, and it's a pleasure to be with you in this HIE Awareness Month. Wonderful. Um, so do you want to give a little bit more detailed overview of you and your, you know, where you practice out of and things like that? So I don't want to get any of that wrong and want to make sure that you can kind of give a little bit more of an in-depth overview. Um, sure, Betsy. So I am a neonatologist. Um, with some training in uh, neonatal neurology and brain development. Um, it's very interesting that I started my training in uh, 2005, and this was a landmark of the uh, publication from the NICHD trial, uh, which was really a big milestone of moving hypothermia from uh, being a research activity to a clinical activity. So I think I was uh, very fortunate to witness this from the beginning. Um, and uh, now I am uh, working at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, in uh, Boston. Um, and uh, this is a level three NICU, uh, which uh, provide uh, different levels of care, but also I'm the director of uh, United Neurocritical Care. Uh, which hypothermia and encephalopathy is a big uh, portion of our uh, population. Um, and uh, yeah, my research has been around um, new monitoring, mainly uh, preterm and term babies, as well as uh, new protection. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm I'm, I learn every day. I think it's uh, always uh, one new thing to learn daily. Wonderful. Great. So let's uh, get started. And can you give kind of a basic overview of neonatal HIE? And, you know, when we talk about neonatal encephalopathy and the there's kind of HIE is a subset of that and kind of go over a little bit of, you know, um, you know, the basics, I guess, you know, we obviously as a, as a family community, you know, we have a certain perspective, but obviously hearing it, um, you know, sound medical, <laughs> um, information is, is what we're here for. So, um, I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, some controversy over the years happened between, uh, naming, uh, neonatal encephalopathy and uh, HIE. Um, I, um, I agree with you that probably the right thing to say is that HIE is just a category of neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, and neonatal encephalopathy is a very general term that we use for so many years. And basically it's just, uh, it's a term describing a baby who has uh, some uh, abnormal uh, neurologic function manifested by just being uh, like abnormal conscious level, uh, possibly with seizures, uh, many times associated with disturbance in breathing and maybe uh, swallowing. Uh, so it's a very general term. Um, when uh, this encephalopathy is due to uh, hypoxia, which is decreased amount of oxygen or ischemia, which is decreased amount of blood going to the brain. Uh, this encephalopathy, you can comfortably call it hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. I, I think the big challenge is uh, you go to a delivery and you are uh, maybe comes out depressed and 
um, all what you can say at this moment that the baby has encephalopathy. And then you need to start to look at the history, look at the circumstances, get more information about the baby. Um, and you reach a certain threshold, which could vary from one place to another to say, I'm going to provide hypothermia for this baby with the presumption at that point that this baby has HIE. So even the HIE at that point could not be a definite diagnosis, but if you have enough evidence uh, by different factors, uh, you would provide hypothermia. Um, and imaging is, I think, is a key part of giving the definite diagnosis. And this, we usually don't get it until maybe a few days of life. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so I, I would say that you need to encephalopathy, although it's a general term, probably it's a safer term to call it at the beginning until you have more conclusive uh, diagnosis of HIE. Very helpful. Thank you. So when you talk about diagnosing, um, what are some of the factors that you, um, you know, that you go through in that clinical exam and things like that, that would point you in that direction to see if a baby, you know, would qualify for cooling or, you know, if for some reason they're outside of that window for, you know, different circumstances, um, you know, kind of meet those different uh, thresholds. Yeah, so I think the first thing we want to look at is uh, what happened? Do we know that there was issues going on through this pregnancy, that this was, for example, a very growth-restricted baby who had other abnormalities that we knew about before birth? Uh, is there any you know, concern that this baby has some sort of you know, congenital infection or a genetic problem? Um, so we need to, to make sure that we are not missing something obvious that has been going on through pregnancy. And we look at what happened around the time of delivery. How was like the fetal tracing before and during birth? Um, and we look at things like the baby's uh, blood gas from the umbilical cord. And we eventually think that the baby gas, when the baby we assess for hypothermia, we really care much about doing a blood gas on the baby to look how much acid in this baby's blood, which is usually a sign the baby was in immediate stress before delivery. Um, the Abgar score is just one of the numbers we look at, which is basically tell you how the baby, when the baby was delivered, uh, how much help did the baby need. Uh, at time of delivery, so it so the like the heart rate, the blood gas, the Abgar score, all this point that there is something around time of birth that could have contributed to the why the baby looked like that. Uh, when it comes to the exam, I think it the exam itself might not differentiate a baby. A baby could be encephalopathic for different reasons. The exam could be the same. It's really around, it's really the most important thing is what happened um, around the time of the delivery. Um, seizures, for example, uh, is always, uh, we think this is a sign of encephalopathy that if we see a baby seizing after delivery, uh, we would definitely diagnose this baby as encephalopathy. But in reality, even seizures to develop usually needs several hours. So if we have a baby that starts to seize right after delivery, that might be something actually pointing to something that happened a while ago, uh, not just around the time of birth. That makes sense. Uh, and the other thing for we we encourage using all the tools we have, so depending where we are. Uh, we have we are fortunate to have a brain monitor, for example, where I work. So sometimes the exam is not very definite. So we, we put the baby on a brain monitor, which is uh, amplitude integrated EEG. And sometimes this adds another layer uh, of assessment how the baby's uh, encephalopathy is and help us in decision making. That's very helpful. 
So um, the treat, obviously treating the onset of HIE and moving forward, you know, we talk about cooling as, you know, this frontline treatment that, you know, certain babies, you have to meet certain criteria to, you know, to get in, you know, the cooling window of six hours and gestational age and things like that. Um, what other kind of interventions are there, um, you know, that could be used with, uh, with a baby that, you know, might need cooling or, you know, is involved in cooling and, and things like that? Um, that's a very good question. What we think that um, HIE is a more like part of a systemic problem because babies do not have just a decreased amount of blood or oxygen going to their brain. Uh, most of the time, if this was a very clear uh, sentinel event, like uh, like separation of the placenta or rupture of the uterus or like avulsion of the cord, this means that this is actually a systemic problem that affects the baby as a whole. Uh, so uh, the most important thing is to manage everything going on with the baby. And hypothermia is one thing that we know that actually helps the brain while there is very minimal evidence that it helps other organs of the body which also are very important so i think that the whole idea is just to manage every single organ and look at all the aspects uh, including breathing support for this baby uh, including the fluid balance managing the electrolytes um, managing um, things like uh, if there's any bleeding tendency. Uh, so the big picture is to, to look at every single organ and make sure that you're supporting this because uh, you, if you don't if you pay attention to this, there are actually more injury can happen later on uh, after delivery if you don't pay attention to that. Uh, the things we do with cooling uh, concerning the brain uh, would be definitely to uh, we do some mild sedation like some evidence that if you provide some sedation you can actually help these babies uh, have more comfortable uh, treatment you can also uh, reduce like shivering uh, so we do use some mild sedation um, we try to be very careful about this because we know that when you're cold, you're not secreting these medications uh, well, so baby can be too sleepy. If there are any seizures, you want to, uh, to diagnose it first, so you have to have these babies on continuous EEG, and you want to treat the seizures as soon as it, uh, it occurs uh, to make sure that uh, this doesn't continue because it still can have the potential to cause uh, more injury. So um, there are a lot of studies looking at adjuvant therapy for cooling. Uh, these are all still investigational. At this point, uh, what we think is the best way to manage these babies is just to pay attention to their all systems and to provide them with the support they need uh, and um, and we would we always want to do this with the parents present. So I think that's the other layer of care that we are paying a lot of attention to it. Uh, that yes, babies are you know sick. Uh, some of them are still you know they are conscious. They are responding to touch. They are able to be supported by by the parents' presence. So we, we very much uh, try to have the parents uh, help in the care of these babies. We allow parents to hold these babies. We even allow some uh, traffic feeding for these babies so that we can uh, provide some breast milk, uh, even a small amount during the process of cooling. Yeah, that's been really amazing to hear over the past, I mean, so my son, Max was born in 2012 and just hearing the advances in, you know, we were told not to touch him at all. It would be, you know, agitate him. Um, he was definitely not fed during that time, you know, um, and just hearing the, you know, and realizing that these treatments really have not been around that long and that this is, you know, still in kind of its 
infant stage of, of development to help this population of, um, of babies. And just amazing to hear how many NICUs now are able to facilitate holds during cooling. Um, and like you said, you know, that neuroprotective care of, you know, breast milk and feeding during, um, you know, during cooling and earlier, whereas before it seems like that was definitely like either we didn't know enough about it or, you know, it hadn't been tested out to see if that risk benefit was there. Um, so, you know, that I think is just something, just an observation over the past several years as a parent and then, you know, seeing all the story share happen in our uh, worldwide community, uh, that this has been a big shift as we've moved forward. So I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, um, you know, because I think this is when we talk about, and you, you alluded to a little bit about the parent involvement and parent partnership. Um, and I think this is like a really nice uh, segue into talking about, you know, the mission of the Newborn Brain Society and the involvement there as well. Um, because I know we first talked in 2019, I remember it was like during the summer and we had this call and it was so wonderful to connect with you um, and talk about like the mission of what you wanted to do and envision of this, you know, now um, nonprofit organization uh, with, you know, I think it's what over a thousand members and it's a global, uh, global organization of different um, people coming together around newborn brains. So I'd love for you to talk about, you know, kind of that multidisciplinary look and, and what the aims are and what newborn brain society is all about. Thanks, Betsy. And uh, I, um, I think that newborn brain society is a uh, very good demonstration of how people from different disciplines can work together for a common goal. Uh, the idea behind the Newborn Brain Society that uh, we have been having different groups working, uh, focusing on the baby's brain and uh, the communication between these groups has not been that great. So we have a small group of neonatologists who focus on baby's brain. Then we have a group of small group of pediatric neurologists who focus on baby's brain. And then the same for like a light health. And at the same time, we have this parent groups that really are seeking, uh, you know, collaboration and uh, good medical information from the world, like supposed to be experts in this field. And it even went beyond this that we started to see some guidelines coming from each of this group, uh, which uh, really uh, it makes it really a must that these people who are focused on one area and want to improve the newborn brain care to work together in a multidisciplinary format, uh, which includes physicians, scientists, allied health, parents, uh, who are aiming for one goal, which is improving the, the newborn brain care. And the idea also was that we don't want to be just focused here locally. Uh, we want this to be a global mission. And uh, we were fortunate to have collaborators from other uh, countries to establish this international uh, society. Um, and the mission is big and think about it, I always think about, let's divide it into small pieces. Uh, and I think the major part is education. That's what we really wanted to make sure that we are able to have um, high quality education for trainee uh, to start from physician side, from practitioners, uh, nurses, and um, also to have reliable parent resources that we can have it available for you both inside the NICU and outside the NICU. Um, then the second part would be to have a more collaborative uh, way to do uh, guidelines that can actually have the input from all these groups together. So more like a unified guideline. Um, one of the challenges, many of the things we do are still need. There's a lot of questions about it, but the goal would be just to start to identify what do we know today and what are the gaps, and then uh, we can present this. And then comes the rule of the 
research and quality improvement committee that we can start to see what are these gaps and start to uh, fill it. Um, and we will not forget the big role of the communication and networking committee, <laughs> which you are leading. And uh, this really has been um, great that we are able to uh, first, you know, be available on uh, different media and different uh, platforms. And we, in just one year, are collaborating with uh, big uh, societies and organizations already. Uh, so I think that's uh, it's very helpful. Uh, we really want to make sure that whatever we do is uh, in sync with other big organizations working on this. And uh, I think that's, that's an important part of our mission is really to make sure that uh, we are we have all this as a collaborative um, effort. Uh, so um, again, one of the big, I would say, achievement for us is to collaborate with Hope for HIE and uh, the amazing work you are doing, Betsy, and uh, also to have our own parent uh, task force so that we are able to incorporate parents in planning our activities and um, I think that would be a very important uh, milestone that we are trying to build now. Absolutely. I'm really excited to see this. And I think, you know, we talked, we've talked so much <laughs> over the past couple of years, but really looking at those affinities, when we look at that global scope and how, you know, we know, and I mean, for us at Hope for HIE, obviously it's awareness month. We have like, you can see in the corner, you know, our theme is team hope. And really we know that when we can come together as a global team, whether it's you know, physicians, allied parents, etc. then it moves things forward in such a better way because then we have all the different um, perspectives on board and can really pull from the strengths um, and, and really move forward this care that we know, um, you know, we can, we can all work together on that. And we, we know where the gaps are <laughs> in many areas um, and seeing what's next because you know, um, all too well as well that there's, you know, there's just so many, um, you know, different uh, unmet needs and different ways of, um, you know, that things that knowledge gaps that we just don't have on the clinical side as well of, um, you know, just looking at where we are today with, I think of in particular, you know, mild HIE, like the, the early research really focused so much on moderate and severe. Um, and we see this every day, you know, like the, it's interesting. And I'm so excited about, you know, these different affinities as we move forward to see things that we trend out in our, you know, global community of over 6,000 families. Um, we see, you know, a lot of times the research interests are like, oh, have you considered this? And I'm like, yes, we've seen this trend for the past five years, you know, um, and mild HIE I think is definitely the work that's being done right now out there is very much what we see of like needing these longer term outcomes tracked um, and looking at across the gamut of, um, of staging. And, and this is a conversation that happens often in our community. So, you know, people get really hung up on, um, you know, like, they've been given a stage. So like against the Sarnat staging and, you know, how does that carry through? Like, you know, is it something like, you know, I, I think in society, we talk about staging and, and cancer is like the top one that people equate it to, right? It's like, oh, are you a stage two? Are you a stage three? What's, you know, what's going on with that? And really, um, I'd love for you to kind of clarify about, you know, the, and, and I know that through newborn brain, this was a topic too, that uh, one of the other, you know, the Dr. Sarna in particular is looking at, you know, updating the Sarnia scale and things like that. So I'd love to hear kind of how that's used and put into practice and what parents should really take away from, you know, their child being put on a Sarnia scale. Because a lot of times that's like a lot of, what, you know, people like, you know, 10 years old will say, oh, my child's HIE3, you know, like, because that's what they were told. And it's like, is that something that we should be saying as parents? Or is that something like, what is the context and nuance behind that? Because I think we that, you know, gets uh, a little murky sometimes. Yeah, I think that's a very, uh, very interesting question, Betsy. And uh, for us, for example, at Boston, uh, at least in my center, 
uh, we moved away from this uh, classification because we felt that's really it's a spectrum and you can start with very mild symptom to a very severe one and uh, well i think for research purpose you have to have this you know clear cut off and stage to 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 publish your data but in real life there's always a spectrum uh, we are um, actually uh, quite on the side of cooling babies who have mild encephalopathy and we understand that there is uh, some uh, questions about this uh, but we think that uh, communication is the key and uh, we talk to our parents and we explain to them what is a concern uh, we we go over the that and saying okay based on what we see uh, we think your baby have mild encephalopathy which we have that to show that this puts your baby at risk of having problems in the future uh, we can't really be confident for your baby specifically uh, if this will happen or not we also know that hypothermia is a treatment that has helped in moderate to severe encephalopathy and there is plausibility that it can help maybe with mild encephalopathy although again the studies has not been including this category and i can tell you that discussion like this um it's helpful uh, most parents will be reassured that we are uh, on the mild spectrum however parents also would would not want to take a chance if we uh, as a as a medical professional feel there is a potential of help uh, they i've never seen a family say oh yeah no i'm I'm fine. I don't want to, to proceed with this. Uh, so, um, so I think that's uh, helpful. Uh, the communication part would be key in this group. And then uh, we always say we will collect evidence day after the other. So we, we just talk about how the exam look like, how they usually look like. Mm -hmm. And we always say, let's wait for the MRI to give us like a full uh, picture um and we always have the hope with even with all these markers pointing to uh, uh, quite uh, significant problems going forward we'd be frank about it but we also emphasize how um, things like early intervention how things like um, the environment at home how um, others some ways of support can actually um, modify this prediction and uh, i think that's always important to to add to any consultation that our knowledge is this is the knowledge we have this is uh, if we this like if things look bad we just say this is just increased like the order of having these abnormal outcomes but we i i would always say that we we can never be definite and there's a lot of things that uh, will will affect your child as he grows that can modify this outcome uh, so i think that's that's a way i i i personally would approach it um and i don't know if giving this category one, two, or some at one, two, or three mm -hmm. is helping anyone. I think that all would be just more statistics. And I think it would be, at this point, the conversation should be what what's happening now to your baby? How is your baby? What's the baby doing? How's the EG look like? How's the MI look like? And what, what does this potentially mean? Um, rather than trying to give a category Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so helpful. I mean, we talk about that there's so many pieces that come together and your child is not one of these pieces. You know, these are just, these are, like you said, things to guide conversations on markers or, um, you know, we talk about, you know, obviously because it is a topic, um, you know, the starting at staging is like one moment in time. Like you're assessing that when the baby's born to help guide treatment and, you know, assessment and see how, you know, things are. Um, and then, you know, the next thing in the HIA NICU experience in particular that is 
kind of a sentinel event is uh, the MRI day, right? And we talk about that a lot. Um, and, you know, kind of the context of MRI as well. Um, you know, I remember our neurologist in particular had um, made it a very, uh, a very point, uh, pointed point <laughs> to say uh, that, you know, babies' brains um, are so watery compared to, you know, they're so underdeveloped, they're still fresh. Um, and so it's really hard, even on MRI, to like put a, you know, total predictive value on, on that. And really the best thing, and it's the most frustrating for parents, because we all want absolutes and we all want these crystal balls, is that clinical presentation, right? And how, and that can evolve over time as well. So, um, and looking at, you know, we call it the great wait and see in HIE because it's, you know, wait and see if your child's going to do this or do that or whatever. Um, and that is, I think that is a whole paradigm shift for that parental experience of, you know, HIE and HIE NICU in particular of looking at what is, you know, what's the possibilities that might happen to my child and how can we help them? And how do I get comfortable being uncomfortable that I'm not going to know for many, you know, up, upwards of many years, in fact. And that's, you know, that's like a, I would say one of the biggest conversations and, and most difficult things from a parental perspective is just, you know, like, I think, you know, what is helpful is a conversation like you mentioned and, and that approach of saying, you know, because of X, Y, and Z, here are, you know, the things that could happen, um, you know, but these are the things that you can do you know, to feel involved and to help your child. Um, because again, the rest of it, you know, it's, it's so hard when each injury is so individual and each recovery is so individual too. You know, I, I remember, and I see it, can, you know, today of families that try to like benchmark it against other people and say, Hey, who had an injury that's you know, to the parietal, the occipital and frontal lobe, you know, and how's your child doing now? You know, and it's like, you know, years later, they're completely different kids, you know, with different challenges or no challenges or many challenges. And it's just, um, it's just one of those, I think, difficult things. So I guess my, my next question to you would be, you know, what's on the horizon for this as we move forward um, and coming together, as you said, you know, with these, you know, scientists and, um, and neurologists and neonatologists, um, you know, Cooling has, you know, we research has tried to do it longer, colder, faster, um, with and without, you know, additives. Um, you know, do we have a sense of what might be next to try, you know, in this acute um, post, you know, birth uh, time for HIE kids and babies? So. I would say concerning research, I think that uh, maybe the couple of uh, interventions that seem promising that I think we're waiting for results uh, for like erythropoietin would be the big uh, medication that's we have like a phase three trial. It's called the HEAL trial and which we're waiting for its results uh, to see if this would be helpful um also um the erythropoietin uh, could help not just in the very acute phase it could help with some uh, tissue regeneration um i think melatonin is a big uh, also uh, treatment that has been very helpful in uh, animal studies and melatonin, you know, is secreted by our pineal body to help our circadian rhythm. It has a lot of anti inflammation, anti oxidation, uh, and other effects. Um, definitely, we are uh, looking for more uh, like stem cell therapy to be very promising. And the whole idea of we always treat within six hours because we want to make sure that we do this before we go into what we call the secondary phase of injury. Uh, but the promise from uh, cell therapy or umbilical cord blood cell uh, therapy or uh, stem cell therapy would be that even beyond this period, we might be able to have some neuroregeneration. Uh, this 
even cell therapy has been helpful even in older children who have cerebral palsy. Uh, so I think this area, I, uh, I think is the most promising uh, and it's, it can be used even for a longer period than just the first few hours. Uh, so I think that's, that's in the horizon, uh, I would say between these three. Um, and I think that optimization is something that we every day are trying to um, to know what we can do differently. Um, so like the Newborn Brain Society is trying to get out uh, two issues in uh, a journal, and this has maybe 23 articles each one just talking about one aspect of management and uh, let's see I, I i just read your draft about parent involvement which is amazing and i think this will be is really putting these small pieces together so even if we are having a lot of questions i think the day-to-day -day management each piece of it we can optimize a little bit and maybe this optimization uh, can help the outcome uh, even a little bit. So, uh, looking forward for this to come out because I think there is a lot of things we can do while waiting for other therapies uh, to come on board. Yeah, that's so important. And I wonder if you can touch a little bit because, you know, one of the things that I think, understandably, our community, our parents are, you know, no one wants to see their child struggle and. Um, you know, in particular, looking at the best ways to optimize, um, you know, their child's development and things like that. Um, and one of the things that comes up pretty regularly, and I know I've brought this up with our medical advisory board before, is just like looking at how parents can have a good understanding of discerning what is something worth trying and something that is maybe um, people's intentions maybe are not as clear for offering a type of therapy that, um, that, you know, we talk about evidence-based medicine, experience-based medicine, and then just, you know, kind of throwing spaghetti at a wall. Um, and, you know, a lot of times what concerns me about some of the different things that are out there, people that are promoting things, um, is that we don't have the efficacy behind some of these things, which isn't to say that it's not, um, you know, not something that would be worthwhile to look for, but I mean, the out-of-pocket costs for so many of these things are just thousands and thousands of dollars. And, you know, for families that already struggle with, um, with life and with, you know, uh, providing for their families, um, you know, I guess what would be the advice that you might give to, you know, those families as the, this is probably a big, hopefully it doesn't feel like a big curveball. <laughs> But, you know, like, I, I just think hearing from, you know, like you have dedicated your life and career to, you know, optimizing um, these babies and you care so deeply about this community. Um, and, you know, I think it's just one of those things that we want to talk through as, as, you know, families do go to look in um, and, you know, get the best for their children moving forward. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... It's a very good question, and uh, I think people should, you know, do the basics, which basics would be to have this uh, follow up that they are connected to. And I think, I think that talking globally, this also might be a challenge to be able to have a more close follow up to monitor the child development. Um, I think that uh, being a parent, being present, being able to uh, nurture the environment your child is, uh, is in uh, is very important. Uh, providing uh, the support and um, the basic services your baby need, and it could be the key part here. Um, the question would be um, other future like as again I, I might not even be aware of the different things but i can imagine the different varieties of uh, things that could be advertised to help i think that 
uh, being part of uh, beer group and a reliable group like Hope for HIE, and hopefully uh, having good resources from reliable resources that like the World Bank Society or other uh, professional organization would be uh, important to, to weigh the evidence behind these therapies. Um, I think that um, there's a lot that can be done, even without going to these uh, questionable uh, therapies and, um, and, and just focusing on the common sense and uh, the things that your child need, which I always say to the parents at the first, I want you to be a parent and the parent, the loving parent, uh, that you are you know, enjoying your child, you are you know, talking to your child, you are uh, reading, you are singing, you are, uh, I think that that's, that's really a, a very important aspect of uh, cure and repair. Um, and people sometimes get focused on, okay, what, 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 what other medicine can I get? What other, you know, mm -hmm. fancy treatment I need to look for? And I think we should focus on the basics first. Um, and I think it will be a very good opportunity that maybe uh, these organizations should be keeping their eyes open uh, for any new therapies that uh, comes out and immediately try to jump in and give guidance about them and at least uh, put more clear evidence that is it helpful or not there yeah that's such i think that's such great advice um and you know that's i think again as parents a lot of times especially after discharge we just you know again you're kind of in this like post trauma situation where you're just wanting to fix your child and fix this what happened and shelter them from you know all of these um you know potentially very difficult things um and i think what we see is you know it's easy to get burned out and then to your point what does that do you know that's not sustainable you know, a lot of times it's just not sustainable like in loving and 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 giving your child experiences and and nurturing their development through singing and reading and all of those things are all those really you know brain boosting things that we know um make those neural connections so that's such a such a wonderful um wonderful advice and i remember in particular my own journey um around 18 months i just got burned out we were you know just all the therapies all the time and um, and then I was like, this is miserable for everyone. Like Max is miserable. We were miserable. And we just took a break and our therapists encouraged and encouraged that. And it was the best thing that we could do for our family. And then we figured, okay, now we got to figure out this balance thing. We got to figure out how to balance, um, you know, the needs of everyone in the family, because, you know, I, I say this all the time to our families too. Like, you know, our kids deserve to have parents that are taking care of themselves and are their best selves too and don't lose who they are you know it's so easy to get, get yourself lost in parenthood in general let alone you know having a child that might have additional needs um and and balancing that um and and that really you know is is something i think that parent mental health is just so important um and and taking care of that will will directly positively impact um kids as well Absolutely, I totally agree. Awesome. Well, gosh, this we've been chatting for a while, <laughs> and I tried to answer some of the questions that came in through um, through the chat with uh, with some of the the conversations we've had. Um, I want to thank you so much for everything, for taking the time today, um, for you know, again, being this um, agent for community building and change as well in the. Um, you know, the clinical side and research side and including parents and families in that. Um, it's, you know, it's really exciting to see where that's going to go um, and how we can best, you know, work to improve the quality of life for, you know, children's and children and families moving forward. 
if everyone that's been paying, uh, paying attention and joining us today, I wanna to thank you. Um, this is our first of four uh, different weekly events that we have this month. So make sure you tune in next week. We're gonna be talking about, we've talked a lot of NICU and acute injury and things like that today. Um, we're gonna be talking about how to bridge from the NICU to community care and things like that and building those good uh, long lasting relationships uh, with providers um, in our next one. Um, so we're excited for that. And then the third week will be um, HIE and seizures. And then the last week is going to be really focused deeply on uh, research. So um, all those events are listed on our website, on our um, social media. So make sure that you guys check in with that. And I want to thank you again, Dr. Aldeeb, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone who has been watching. Thank you. Thank you.